Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship on this third Sunday in Easter. The Lord is with you. And also with you. Amen. Uh, this past week, uh, as far as for a national level, an international level, it doesn't seem like there was anything as far as for encouragement that I, could, that I could sense. But this past Wednesday, I had the opportunity to uh, have lunch with your new pastor. He seems like a, a nice fellow, a more upbeat a people person, uh, a person with a, a balance, not overly rigid, but again, just a nice, caring individual. So... Um, um, it will be my prayer that you break them in right, <laughs> starting on the 15th, by God's grace. We begin now by lighting the Paschal candle. The light of Christ. We sing the first hymn. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sin, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are Since we are gathered to hear God's word and to call upon him in prayer and praise and the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Amen. 
Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. First reading is from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 22. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and falling onto the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here am I, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in 
and laid his hands on him so he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard about this man, from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me to you that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Isn't this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from the book of Revelation, chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who is seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll, and to open its seals, for you are slain, and by the blood you are ransomed people for God. From every tribe and language and a people and nation, and you have made the kingdom a priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. This is the word of the Lord. Would you rise with the gospel for eight moments? <clears throat> the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 21st chapter. 
Glory to you, O Lord. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the, into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on the land, they saw a, char a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were not, there were not so many, the, excuse me, there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he had raised, been raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to them, to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you and you will, and where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Would you be seated, please?
grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, chief of sinners, that's me. But you are a God of grace, and I pray that you would anoint me, that I might be able to speak this message, that you would use me as uh, your vessel to share, so that I might be able to encourage the brethren this way, this day, um, concerning your grace upon grace, that we are enabled uh, by your power to share and to be a blessing to many others. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The Lord is with you. And also with you. Amen. I'd like to begin by sharing a, a picture of, of a gentleman who endured some violence some years ago. <clears throat> His name is Rodney King. And uh, back in 1991, uh, an amateur video recording uh, showed uh, Rodney King being taken out of his car and being beaten badly by some Los Angeles uh, policemen. And to make matters worse, uh, in the next year after the trial, you know, after going through the trial system, the, his assailants were exonerated. And that caused the Los Angeles riots back in 1992. However, there's another man who was involved with this whole thing that maybe uh, you've forgotten him. Can we see the next slide? His name is, his name is Reginald Denny. And uh, Reginald happened to be driving his truck the same day as, this, as the first day of the riots. And he got into this one intersection and it was blocked by a crowd of people and he couldn't get through. And recognizing that he was a white man, there were a couple of fellows that uh, pulled him out of his truck and then they started beating him with, with, on the head with a broken bottle. And they kicked his head so that his head caved in, one side of his head caved in. And then um, sometime later uh, in court, and this was uh, uh, had national attention because uh, that video of Reginald Denny, that was seen by a helicopter, and that was all recorded also. So the nation saw what had taken place to Reginald Denny. So in court, uh, his assailants were, were still hostile and unrepentant. But uh, Reginald Denny uh, got up, and uh, his uh, face was still contorted and swollen. But he started moving towards the uh, mothers of the defendants. And he told those mothers that if he forgave their sons. And they stood up, and they hugged him, and one of them said, I love you. Very touching scene. And one wonders uh, regarding those uh, men who were in the handcuffs, who were seated there at that time, what kind of effect it had on them to see this taking place. Not sure. But this most much I do know, that it's only forgiveness that is able to uh, thaw a cold heart that is uh, overwhelmed by guilt. And I share with this with you as a backdrop for the, today's lesson from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9, and a man named Saul who was a persecutor of the church. And like Reginald Denny, there was a man by the name of Stephen. And Stephen also experienced issues with a mob. And if you can remember, Stephen was a a godly man, and people could not stand up to his, uh, uh, to his witness to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I mean, it was a powerful witness, and uh, again, the Jewish leaders uh, were frustrated with him. They continued uh, to challenge him, and then one day, Stephen, uh, I guess apparently he just had enough, and so uh, he went through this uh, long history of the people of Israel, and it ended up that they were, had been stiff-necked through all the generation, generations and centuries. 
But then added to that, Stephen uh, said that he, he was seeing the heavens open and uh, God was, was there in the heavenlies on his throne and Jesus was at the right hand. And that's all it took. Uh, and then his accusers became a mob and they dragged him out of town and they stoned him to death. But as Stephen was dying, he also, like Reginald Denny, um, was forgiving. And he said, Lord, do not hold this against them. And the key individual concerning all of this was Saul. And he was part of this. And he became that violent persecutor of the church. But Saul could not forget what happened with Stephen and how Stephen handled uh, what was taking place. And whether he liked it or not, there was a thawing effect that was going on in his heart, though he was fighting it tooth and nail. And later in uh, the book of Acts, uh, Saul, who becomes Paul, relates to King Agrippa what had taken place. His, uh, his story, he re basically what you've just heard, but he repeats that. But um, Saul says this. Can we see the next slide? The Lord, and he said, the Lord is speaking through the blinding light. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. The goads. And goads were used uh, back in Bible times. They were sharp sticks, and they were used uh, to prod cattle just to prod cattle in the right direction. And of course, uh, what's being talked about here is goes on conscience. And Paul, excuse me, Saul could not free himself um, from that witness or testimony of Stephen. And you could say that it was like, uh, like a murderer who was holding on to his hate until there came that time there was that blinding light, and he heard those words, Saul, Saul. And in the Hebrew, uh, the word for ask is shoel. And from that, you get shawl or Saul. And so what Saul was hearing in the Hebrew is ask, ask. And so what did Saul do? He asked, who are you, Lord? And finally, he who was born to ask had asked. And he found out that he really didn't know who God was. But he had asked that question, and now he was told, I am Yeshua, I am Jesus. What an experience that was. And in truth, what took place uh, was that Saul was experiencing a Paul moment. And the word uh, Paulus, so Paul, comes from the Greek or pao, which means to cease, to desist, or to pause. So uh, it's like a video recording that you're playing along, but you press pause, and everything stops, you know, in mid-action. And so what, it, what took place is that God pressed pause on the life of this man. And for three days, there was this time of refining and purifying in his life. And there was a, this opportunity for, uh, for him to start to see things differently, to think outside of the box, as it were, um, in a very powerful way, that there was change that was taking place in his life through those three days. And so picture this man, he's uh, seated, his legs are crossed, he's gaunt, he's uh, moving back and forth in prayer, his eyes are like orbs, but he can't really see anything because of the, the film, the scales that are there. So he's uh, really struggling through all of this in his life. So 
this man, again, is um, in a situation. His name is Paul, becomes Paul. And there is this ceasing, there is this pause, assisting, so that the old life of Saul would be no more. Again, that's what was taking place. And what would happen next? And that's when God pressed play again, and there is this man by the name of Ananias that comes to Paul. And he would lay hands on, on Paul so that Paul would be able to, to see again. So would he be able to see again. And again, what's his name? His name is Ananias. But it's, his name is not by chance. Because in the Hebrew, it's Kanaya, which meant Yahweh is Yahweh, the God of Israel. Kana is grace. So what would it be that Saul would see when he is able to open his eyes and the scales are gone, he will see Kanaya, the grace of God. And Ananias would lay hands on him, and again, he would be uh, restored to sight. He would become uh, eventually baptized and become a follower of Christ through all of this. And no doubt it was probably shocking when Ananias said, Brother Saul, Brother, I'm the one who's been murdering your brother. So, I mean, so what does that mean? But in a, in a very powerful way, Saul was going to be restored. The, the gates of heaven were going to be open. There would be forgiveness. And the world would not be the same after this, after this event taking place. In a, a very powerful way that... Uh, Change was, was taking place in this man. Uh, and it would be, again, a, a barrier-breaking grace that he would bring into the world. A barrier-breaking grace. And that's, in a sense, what Ananias uh, was, was saying when he said, Brother Saul. In other words, uh, it doesn't make any difference who you were and uh, what you've done in Christ were brothers. That's essentially what Ananias was, was inferring when he said brother Paul, brother Saul. The, this breaking down of the barrier of grace. And when it came to Judaism, it was all about those barriers. Uh, in Judaism, and, and just when it came to the temple, you could only go so far in the outer court, and then there would be the, the, the wall of the, uh, of the Gentiles, and you couldn't go beyond that uh, if you were a Gentile because you'd be put to death. And when people were ranked uh, in, in Judaism based on their race, their gender, uh, their physical health, if they had defects, and when it came to uh, the Jewish, uh, pious Jewish man, the first uh, prayer that he would have in the morning is he would thank God that he was uh, not uh, a Gentile, they were considering him to be dogs, that he was not a slave or he was not a woman. I mean, that's the way it was in that culture. But then with the coming of Jesus, there was this, breaking down of this hierarchy. And Jesus was willing to uh, accept people, you know, uh, Gentiles and sinners and the tax collectors, people who were, had defects, that they were all welcome among the people of God, invited to the banquet of God. And for this reason, they crucified him because of what he was doing to their system. But in our lesson we find that uh, the risen Lord is ordaining one who would follow him, and that's Saul, who has become Paul. And Saul would go from uh, place to place, making disciples, but uniting people from diverse backgrounds so that they could be the pe people of God together. People who were united 
who were seeing the world and the other people with uh, grace-healed eyes, you could say, where the scales had come down in their lives and there were more grace-healed eyes. And with that in mind, uh, and again, this is for us today, how are you progressing when it comes to being freed of some of your issues? Um, classism, racism, uh, cultural imperialism, pride or bigotry. How are you doing when it comes to that in your life? And this is something that the early church dealt with well. And in your heart of hearts, how are you doing when it comes to uh, this issue, again, of prejudice, the way that you look at other people. And here's a test. If you would rather have a friend of rel a relative of yours marry somebody of uh, the same race and uh, status, uh, but it doesn't make any difference if they're a Christian or not, rather than somebody who was of a different race, or status, who is a dedicated Christian, then you do not have grace-healed eyes. You don't. And just thinking about this a little bit more, um, when we were down in uh, Florida back in February, we have some good friends, uh, Helga and Laszlo, and Helga was uh, the organist at the church I served um, back in New Jersey, and her husband likes to talk about spiritual issues. So we got on the subject. They have a 17-year-old daughter. And I, I said to him, uh, we, were, we were talking about race and what's going on in our culture. And I said, um, how would you feel about your daughter marrying a person of color? And uh, Laszlo said, be no problem. But Laszlo uh, is from Hungary where they didn't really have that issue, where it wasn't part of the culture uh, like it is here. So later, my, uh, my wife asked Sandy, my wife Sandy asked Helga, Lasso's wife, uh, what if it was a gypsy? And that changed the whole equation, because uh, gypsies, uh, there's prejudice against gypsies in Hungary. So how important it is when it comes to our lives, the mission of this church, that we would, um, we would have those grace-healed eyes. You know, how vital it is when we look at somebody who's different than we are, that we don't start to put up a little bit of a wall there or to be more curt with them, or um, just uninterested in them. And you know, we've already got them, as it were, kind of figured out. How important that we'd be more free of that? How important that we would be willing to come alongside other people and to, uh, to be a help, to be a support to them, and maybe even if they're, these initially, because of their circumstances, they're maybe not as friendly as you'd like them to be. And it was uh, about three weeks ago that I was in, uh, there were, the food pantry was going on over here in the cafe. And uh, there was a gentleman uh, there, a person of color. I'd seen him once before. He was seated. So I started talking to him, and I wanted to uh, just talk about faith and about church, but he just got hostile and just walked away. But afterwards, I said to myself, uh, what do I, did I expect? I mean, this, I, I know where he lives. He lives in Section 8 housing. And I know about the, these, a lot of these people who are in the Section 8 housing and their background. And many of them, again, have come from the, from the inner city, 
or there has been brokenness in their lives. Many of them don't know who their father was. I mean, back in the 1960s, 74% of the African-American families were united. Now it's down to only 24% where there's a father and a mother in the house. The rest of them don't. They didn't have a father. I mean, just imagine being raised with that. So I start thinking about this man and his background and how it might have been for him just, just growing up as a child and dealing with Whitey and just wondering how many times he heard the N-word in his life. So yeah, how important is to be willing to listen to people? And uh, for me, I'm, I'm pretty good about striking up a conversation, and, but I'm still continuing to be concerned about time restraints and, you know, don't make it too long, uh, that's, you know, but just a, more of a casual conversation, that's more me. But how important to really sit down and to listen and to hear their story, be willing to hear their story. And it uh, sounds cliche, but maybe to try to walk in their shoes a little bit, what their life was like. And years ago, there was a, a pop singer by the name of Ray Stevens, and he had a popular song. It was everything is beautiful. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red or yellow, black or white, they are precious in the sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Remember that one? But later on, the uh, song gets more serious. Can we see the next slide? There is none so blind as he who will not see. We must open our eyes. We must not close our minds. We must let our hearts be free. We shouldn't care about the length of his hair or the color of his skin. Don't worry about what shows from without, but the love that lives within. Pretty profound words. And I'm believing that that man of color had some of that love underneath. I really believe that. And I'm believing that uh, St. Paul would have said amen to all of this, this talk we've got going on right now, this sharing. Well, Paul said in 2 Corinthians, no longer do we consider a person based on, on worldly values. We don't look them at that person as the world looks at them. Again, seeing people with those uh, grace-healed eyes, how important is that for us? To be willing to uh, share our time with people, our fellowship with people, even our homes with people that we don't know. To get to know them for a period of time, but. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing just to invite them over for coffee or even more than that? Just to get to know them, and that would even move to spiritual conversation to talk about how God's working in their life. What they think about what's going on in this world. What they think about the race issue. What do they think about white people? Are they racist? I mean, to get in those conversations and to start breaking those barriers down. It starts with us in this church. But most certainly it doesn't happen if it's just a Sunday morning, we're in and we're out. I mean, there's got to be more of a dedication of us and growing in fellowship and discipleship and encouraging one another and those fellowship opportunities to make those things happen. It may be so. May those walls keep crumbling down. May those scales keep coming off. Uh, that we would uh, not just uh, talk to talk, but walk to walk with our grace-healed eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts, keep your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. At this time, would you please rise for the creed? (laughs) 
I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not me, being in one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was seen man. And was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again in glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Would you be seated? We continue with the prayers of the church. We extol you, O Lord, for restoring and forgiving us through the sacrificial death and glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. When we fall upon hard times, continue to lift us up out of the depths. And Lord, we extol you. Lord, for those within the body of believers, we pray that you would lift them up. Those throughout the world, we pray that you would bless them with your guidance and direction through your word. That they would be changed by your barrier breaking grace. That the scales of prejudice would fall away. A grace that destroys the old eyes and identities. Who people were and what they have done. So that a new and supportive family of God might arise. Lord, in your mercy, Merciful Savior, for those whose lives have been turned upside down by calamity and tragedy, especially those in the Ukraine, and the loved ones of those dispossessed, and trying to find sanctuary and a new home, Lord, may you grant them, bless them through others with resources, through your ever-sufficient spirit, and even through the moving of national agencies, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And all powerful God, for those we know to be lacking faith in Jesus, we ask that your Holy Spirit may use us in some way to turn our hearts to you. Use us to show them the enormity of their sin, that they might flee for refuge to the throne of mercy and grace. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Lord, we pray for Pastor Labou, who might well be with us in worship this next Sunday, moving this, this coming week with his family. May you prosper their efforts. May you continue to pray or prepare his heart and our hearts uh, that there might be a, a meaningful fellowship and relationship and growing together in grace. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, we pray for those situations on the border, so much in the way of tragedy, millions coming in, again, planes flying out in the middle of the night to different places and a lack of control. Uh, Lord, we, we pray that there would be this uh, effort that would be made to put things in a, in a better way for the sake of uh, this nation 
for our future. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord, we pray for the organist search, uh, because it would be a, a godly person who would, uh, would be with an organist with us more full time. We thank you for Fran who's with us now. And also, uh, Lord, that we would continue to bless and lift up people. There's this cultural war that's going on regarding values. Uh, continue to raise up those who would stand for your word and for your truth. And may we in this church uh, have this desire to grow as, as disciples in, in grace and truth and wisdom and uh, this desire, again, to touch the lives of others. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. we ask you, Lord, that you would be the help to the afflicted. We pray for those who suffer or in need. May you continue to strengthen either Stobbs, Donna Pizzelli, Jared Bunce, who's recovering from surgery. Also, we pray for Bernice Timmerman, for Walter Krauss. Also, may you be merciful to Ewald Hauer as he's trying to adjust to the nursing home. Thank you again that Marlene Johnson is with us. Have mercy on Fritz and Jeanette Moshman, both who know of great weakness. And also, Lord, we pray for Mary Phillips, making those adjustments. Keith and Regina of Nitsch, uh, both know of uh, weaknesses. May you continue to lift them up. And also, Lord, we thank you for Eric Bobka. May you further bless him. They had Mike, who's a good, loving caregiver. Also, Lord, we pray for Lillian O'Donnell, Jack Shannon, Bob Connor. <coughs> and Phil Schimke. May you allow healing in your good time and your good way. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Lord, uh, may you uh, continue to have mercy and bless Bob and Donna Bloxham, Ed and Wanda Pallas, Eugene and Hannah Lorenz, Walter and Frank Krauss as they celebrate their anniversaries. Uh, may they give you the glory. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Lord, now we pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Amen. At all times and every way, the Lord be with you all. Amen. Amen. We continue now.